Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. And I guess one of our members has just seen the cup recently. Before our speaker today, let's listen to uh, Keith. Would you tell us something about the cup? Well, the cup is very secure. It's in a beautiful place in a wonderful yacht club. Aha, Royal New, New Zealand Yacht Squadron. Good on you. Perfect. Thank you, Keith, for that report. <laughs> the best reports are the brief reports. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. You want to stop on by on June the 20th. Uh, the noted naturalist Michael Ellis will be here to talk all about the mysteries of the Mojave, once a lake, now the deepest desert in North America. And then uh, come on by on uh, May the 2nd. Steve Yeshia will be here to talk all about um, the America's Cup. He is the chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee. So he'll, you'll want to listen to what he has to say. Um, you want to stop by as well on, um, it'll be February 28th. John Stephen Dews is a great painter of nautical maritime art, and he'll uh, have his work on exhibit here for a week. A couple, uh, quite a bit of his artwork will be here, and he'll come and talk all about, you know, the maritime uh, art world. Uh, Kimball Livingston will be here to talk about dynamiting the junior program and how he's changing all of that. And... And uh, Dave Holscher will be by on March the 7th to talk about swimming from here to the Fairlands and back. And Ron Holland will be by in May to talk all about his new book, uh, Designing by the Seat of My Pants. Ron Holland's designed more incredible yachts from 17 to 217 feet than anybody that I know. And uh, he will tell you how he's been doing it, which is, as he will say, is catch as catch can. Now, a little bit about our speaker today. First time he was ever on a boat, he was stuffed into a basket under the foredeck of the family Lightning under a year of age because they couldn't find a babysitter. And there he was having a good time uh, sailing along before he really knew exactly what anything outside that foredeck looked like. Uh, beginning around age four, he was regularly crewing on the family Lightning and or Snipe and or Flying Scott. They had all three. And by the age of nine, he had his own snipe. All by himself, he could race it. He was skipper, and he had a local family friend, a lady, who was uh, his crew. At age 10, sadly, his grandfather died, and he, Tom, inherited the family grandfather's Flying Scott and started racing it. At age 13, he won the Junior North Americans in the Sunfish class. That is a heck of a class with 120 boats on the line. At age 17, he got early admission to the University of Michigan and began racing with the classmate above him, Bruce Nelson. And they won basically everything in intercollegiate world. They won the Kennedy Cup and the Sloop Championships and the team racing uh, regatta. So they basically were the fast intercollegiate guys back in those days. At age 19, on his own, he won the Flying Scott North Americans and for the next four years dominated with three out of the four victories following up. In, 19, in, in 1976, he won the Champion of Champions in a wide flyer. I've raced the Champion of Champions. That is an incredible regatta, and to win it at, you know, at such a young, tender age was quite an accomplishment. Uh, at, in 1979, he became the youngest ever, at age 25, executive director of what was then USYRU. We now know it as U.S. Sailing. Uh, and he basically held that post for six years, most notably during the 1984 Olympics, where Tom and I met at, when I was coaching Russ Silvestri in uh, the Olympic trials. Uh, that Olympics, it should be noted, was the most successful American Olympics ever. We medaled in all 10 classes. At the end of that year, he became executive director of the American uh, challenge for the America's Cup by the New York Yacht Club, America 2, and we were counterparts as I uh, was general manager of San Francisco's first challenge for the America's Cup, the Golden Gate Challenge. So we collaborated with each other a fair amount during those years. Uh, we, as he pointed out uh, earlier today, uh, San Francisco beat New York in that series three out of four, two out of three times, and um, enjoyed a great rivalry in that competition. 
um, in 1988, Tom's reminded me, he didn't think it was that great. It was really great. Uh, in 88, at the end of that, after Dennis uh, won the America's Cup, we, the Golden Gate Challenge, lost the Defender Trials to Dennis. He went on to win the whole shoot match. And Tom went on to become executive director of the America's Cup Organizing Committee in San Diego in 88. In 92, when I was working for Bill Koch, he became the executive vice president of the ACOC and helped conduct the races. And in 95, became a rules advisor to Team DC, uh, when, who lost to the Kiwis. And then in 2000, he became the minister of external affairs for our own um, Paul Kayard's America One uh, Challenge for the America's Cup. In 2003, seven, 10, and 13, he held the same post, kind of Minister of External Affairs, it's an informal title, but in charge of all external affairs for uh, Larry Ellison's activities as he challenged, challenged, and won on his uh, third challenge. Uh, in 2010, when we were uh, over in Valencia. In 2017, just a year ago, he founded Sailing Illustrated and has been a collaborator with our Yacht Club and the Windsor Yachting Luncheon for the live Facebook broadcast of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon um, uh, activities. I could not find and could not think of a more authoritative person to speak about the America's Cup than our speaker today. Please welcome Tom Eben. Thank you, Ronnie. Most of that was not true, but... He does an amazing job. You know, he sits, he's been doing this for what, 14 years? Yeah. He sits here, he interviews whoever's talking, whatever knucklehead he's signed up to do this thing. I mean, it's a hard job. Week after week, year after year, gets, let's give him, get him a hand. <laughs> Ronnie, notwithstanding, he likes to tell you about himself, too, and how his connection is to the guest. I was surprised he didn't serve on the Board of Governors last week for the Federal Reserve. Well, that... <laughs> Oh, you didn't mention that, but what a great talk. Uh, this, this title, Minister of External Affairs, uh, Bruce Monroe, Commodore Monroe used to say, well, that's, I'm sure, with a heavy emphasis on affairs, which wasn't, which wasn't true. That was given to me by the late, great Bob Billingham when I joined America One, this, the Buddha, this syndicate. May he rest in peace. Uh, I also want to recognize our team that's doing the live stream. I've got the thing going, but... You, Philip, stand up quickly so they can see you. You could recognize Philip Mendoza. He normally is the wait staff here in the grill room. He runs a video gig on the side. And Ryan, why don't you stand up as well? Because Ryan crews with Ron, and he's uh, given us Ryan who helps. And together with, where's Bob Sky? Robert back here in the back. Bob Sky, who's our technical wizard, together with Gio and, and the, with the support of the club. Look, we had now three live, three television screens. We don't have to roll the blinds down so Ron can say, look at this beautiful, you didn't say it today. We had a camera shot planned to take out here this beautiful view. Come on, Ron. An incredible, beautiful view outside these beautiful windows. <laughs> Did you get that, Ryan? Thank you. And, of course, Julia, who's our coordinating producer, she is watching the stream to be sure that it doesn't mess up. By the way, the last two streams, this is for you techno, techno nerds, I'm talking to you, Jimmy DeWitt. This is, we're streaming live at 30 frames a second in the last two weeks. And so far, how are you doing, Philip? Zero. We have lost not 30 frames a second. That's six frames a second faster than normal TV, right, Bob? And we haven't lost, dropped a single frame because we have good internet connection here. We had a great technical team, and thank you all. We have people signing on last week. Not many people watching the show live because we haven't promoted it. But last week we had people watch the, we had live, somebody from Cape Town last week. We have people in New Zealand watching today, New York, because of the America's Cup theme. I heard from people all morning, oh yeah, you're going to be talking at St. Fancy, I want to see this. So the replay, which is available on Facebook, the, the live is available on your, on our Facebook.com slash St. Francis Yacht Club. You don't have to be a Facebook member. You don't have to have a Facebook account. Anybody can watch this. It's just like any other website. Click on it, go watch it, and the replay goes up immediately, virtually immediately after the show. And it's there, God forbid, in perpetuity. 
So we now are, and Julie has been insisting on this, Ron has worked with Noel and with the gang. We now, and um, uh, what's our, Meredith Latos. We now have all the shows up on facebook.com slash St. Francis Yacht Club. So you can go back and see what the gentleman said last Wednesday, for example. You can see what uh, Kimball's going to say next week. When you right get now. Right now. You, yeah, you can hear it hear in advance. Sorry. So this is truly an innovation. I don't know of any other yacht club in the world that is doing this. It's not rocket science, as Bob will tell you, to live stream, but it's not easy as well. So thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Julie and, and Bob and everybody else for pulling this together. Okay, to start with, I want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. It was, uh, it's an anniversary, an America's Cup anniversary we'll come to in a minute. I also want to wish a very happy birthday to this gentleman who turned 88 yesterday. I also want to recognize a member of this club, and I saluted him on our, we do a Tuesday live show for Sailing Illustrated over here in our Beach BS Yacht Club studios. <laughs> I got it in. Um, Malin Burnham, who is a member of this club, Dean of Yachting in San Diego, longtime member of this club, was awarded the Harrisoff Trophy, the Nathaniel G. Harrisoff is the proper pronunciation, at the U.S. Sailing. Uh, Bill Dana, you were there, weren't you? You were at the meeting at the leadership conference, leadership forum down in St. Pete Beach a week ago. Malin Burnham, a member of this club, awarded the highest service award in our sport in this country. So I just want to give Malin well-deserved. Uh, well right, Bruce. Thank you. And finally, it is the anniversary. Eight years ago today, Valentine's Day, when the Golden Gate Yacht Club, BMW Oracle Racing, won the 33rd America's Cup. Now, some of, how many of you are students of the history of the Cup? Anderson is. He's, he's back there. Um, who is this lady? I, I've done the history of the America's Cup in 12 slides. I worked really hard to cut this down to only 12 slides. Uh, who is that? Queen Elizabeth? No. Some, I was going to, I was going to put a picture. Of, I won't tell you who I was going to put a picture. Of. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. What year? The answers are on the slides. The answers are on the slides. 1851. Queen Victoria's husband, the prince, consort prince. Come on, you've heard this before. You've given this talk before. Prince Albert had the first ever World's Fair, Hyde Park Crystal Palace, upper right-hand corner, and in conjunction with that, they had a race for all nations. This was a radical concept around the Isle of Wight. The only country to show up to race in this race on Friday for the Royal, see the bottom, second to bottom line on that poster. That poster exists. It's in the elevator at New York Yacht Club, or was. The Royal Yacht Squadron's 100-pound cup. Not the 100-guinea cup. Guinea and a pound was different. 100-pound cup was offered up. There it is. It was on the shelf at the Royal Yacht Squadron. They pulled it off and said, here, we'll have a race with the only team that showed up, which was the Yacht America, America from the yes. esteemed New York Yacht Club. And they raced around the Isle of Wight. And, of course, as the America came back in ahead of how many British vessels? Thirteen others. Do you know who was second? <laughs> okay, you win. You win. Your Majesty, there is no second because the second place boat, which was? Second place boat. Come on, Anderson, you know. There is no second. Aurora, the yacht Aurora was so far back that the signalman, the Queen's signalman, could not see who it was, supposedly. Truth is, it wasn't that far back. Do you know that the yacht Aurora is the only boat of the 13 that is not inscribed on the actual America's Cup from 1851? There's a piece of trivia for you. So there, Your Majesty, there is no second, has come to define the America's Cup because as Larry Ellison once said, either you win or you're the first of the losers. <laughs> New York brought the cup back and had this radical idea. Remember, this is pre-Civil War America. They had the radical idea to deed it, to write out a, it's a handwritten deed of gift. I have a photocopy of it. But because Julia told me I could only do, use 12 slides to do the history handwritten deed of gift that went through several drafts and finally in 18, not till 1857, did they deed it formally 
on the condition that it shall be preserved as a perpetual challenge trophy, per cha perpetual challenge cup for friendly competition between foreign countries. A radical idea in pre-Civil War America. So that was 1857, and then watch this, Julia. Julia, watch this. I cover almost 100 years in one slide. <laughs> Who's that in the upper left corner? Sir Thomas Lipton. How many times did he challenge? How many times did he lose? Five. And what did Mayor Jimmy Walker do for him? Gave him a ticker tape parade down the Fifth Avenue and a little loving cup that was, in, I'm not kidding, that's engraved to the world's best loser. <laughs> no joke. He was very popular. He was always the epitome of sportsmanship. He sold a lot of tea in the meantime all over the world. And that cup is up there on the fourth floor at New York, up there in, outside the wardroom. Who is the gentleman in the middle who won in 1977 after he did the Playboy interview? Remember the Playboy? Packy, I remember. You showed it to me when I was about 13 years old, I think. <laughs> but you were just looking for the articles, the Playboy interview, Ted Turner, right? <laughs> Packy. Get, get Packy some chocolate chip cookies and some coffee. He needs to wake up here. <laughs> the Mouth of the South won in 1977, and between that, and remember President, which president came to Newport because he was a sailor? Carter. Who said Carter? He was a peanut farmer, for God's sakes. <laughs> JFK and Jackie and the, the Kennedy family were sailors, Hyannis Port and so on and so forth. Famously good sailors. He had a starboat. He, the boat's just been restored by somebody. Somebody bought it and restored it. Famously good sailor, and I submit to you that that's why the sport boomed in the 60s, not because of just because of Dacron and fiberglass and, and the, the, the baby boom generation coming through after the post-war, the post-war generation. I think because the Kennedys were on Look, Life, Saturday Evening Post, Kimball probably wrote stories about it. Oh, he's not that old. But I submit that's why the sport boomed, because we had a celebrity sailor in the, pres in the, in the, in the President Kennedy who went to Newport, and I, I took the slide out, Julia, who went to Newport in 1962 and made a big splash, and the media followed. And the media started following the America's Cup which was a big boost for Turner in 77 when he finally, well, when he won. Okay. What's this? What year is this? 1983. 1983, and this is the last race of the Cup. Anderson, you can't, Dick. You, seven. Race 7, September 25, 1983, and the vote on the left in this shot on Port Tack is just crossing Liberty on the penultimate leg, the sixth leg of that race off Newport to win the, go on and win the fourth and final race in 19, as you all knew, 1983. And that was the end of New York Yacht Clubs. How long did they hold the cup from 1851 until 83? You can do the math. 132 years, the longest winning streak in sports, widely regarded as the longest winning streak in modern sports, any sport. Fast forward to, look at, Dennis. look at Dennis. He was a handsome guy. Still is, of course. Did I say that? <laughs> California's president, President Reagan, 1987, when they brought the cup back, famously, of winning it down under when we were, Ronnie, we were talking about your good challenge and our so-so challenge for New York. Fast forward to this picture, which I'm sure you'll all know when that was taken. What year? Who's the gentleman on the back of the boat in the scoop who looks like he's pregnant? Well done, well done. Lenny, you're right, that's Kayard, and he just, I think his, his jumper, his sweatshirt is just puffed out a bit. But Paul and I and Dennis, and that's Billy Trankel, I think we're all there. Um, the late, great Jack Sutphin. We are pushing Russell Coots and the late, great Sir, Russ, uh, Sir um, Peter Blake off the back end of their boat. We've gone over and took, well, they're on our boat, actually, congratulating them, pushing them in the water, and that was 1995. That was when we lost. In San, now remember, San Diego Yacht Club, since New York lost in 83, how many clubs have successfully defended? Well, they won it. We won it. San Diego did in 87. They won it. I wasn't with them. They beat us, Ron. Then... They defended successfully in 88, we did, I was helping, 88 and 92, and then we lost in 95. No other club has successfully defended twice since New York lost it in 83. 
not Golden Gate. We won it in 2010, defended once in 2013, and lost. Not the Kiwis, they won it in 95, defended it in 2000, lost it in 03. Not the Swiss, not anybody. Now the Kiwis have won it back. They're the first club to lose it and then win it back, Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. So this is a, not only the, Ron, is part of your lead-in for this, the, the oldest trophy in international sports. It's arguably the toughest trophy to win. It's only been raced now. This will be the 36th match coming up in New Zealand in 2021. Uh, one last slide is when Alinghi won it and took it to Europe, won it in New Zealand in 2003, took it to Europe, defended in 07, and then Ernesto Bertarelli, for reasons that still escape a lot of us, tore up what were then the rules that we'd all used since, literally since the 30s, and created his own cup. I wonder if Larry learned from this, but that was a joke. <laughs> Larry, if you're watching, I'm sorry, I didn't. So, 2003, and then they defended in 07, and then along came our challenge, which was a deed of gift challenge because they tried to do a whole different deal. They tried to put themselves completely in charge, run all the rules themselves, and we then filed what's called a deed of gift challenge, a literal challenge under that 1857 piece of paper. And the courts, after they, they rejected the challenge, the courts forced them to accept the challenge. We then built this trimaran up in Ana Cortez, up, in the, up north of Seattle, practiced down in San Diego, and then for the first time a club in San Francisco won the cup eight years ago today, Valentine's Day 2010 off Valencia, Spain. And that we, I don't know if we celebrate that. Will we celebrate something like that at St. Francis Yacht Club, Ron? Yes, we should say San Francisco won the cup. Okay, we celebrate that. But we do want to commemorate it, and Philip, here's our first video. It's the limits of what's possible in sailing in the 21st century. This is extreme sailing. We'll probably never it's see the something limits like this again. Of what's possible Not in our lifetimes. In sailing in the 21st century. It was a century. quest. This is extreme sailing. We'll probably never see something like this again. Not in our lifetimes. It was a quest building the best possible team we could build, building the fastest possible boat, and seeing if we could bring the America's Cup back to America. Human ingenuity, with the oldest trophy in international sport at stake. Larry Ellison said, the BMW Oracle sailing team is much better than yours. <laughs> it's, quite, uh, it's quite funny, coming from Larry Ellison, what is he going to do if he loses? Ernesto took the rules and just tore them up. Ernesto, why are you doing this? It's like a heavyweight championship fight where the fighters don't like each other very much. And may the best team win. The America's Cup. It is a race sailed across tides and generations. Representing your country in, in an international sporting event? I get chills just talking about it. In Valencia, Spain, the America's Cup on the line today. For me, you know, it's a dream come true. USA 17 is flying. Look at her go. It was really sort of knife edge. Oh, my goodness. That's too close for comfort. Both boats were redlining the whole time. The American team could be in trouble. We thought we had a much faster boat. Alinghi out in front. USA 17 playing catch up. We never should have let him get that separation. There is no second place in competition in the game of life. First place is all there is. It's a uh, cruel fate. Heart pounding drama. That luck plays a part. USA is getting closer. Can they catch Alinghi? Here they come! It's to some degree in the hand of the wind gods. Incredible! Unbelievable! What a race! That is the trailer from a much longer movie called The Wind Gods that um, Larry produced, that we produced, and is still maybe the best America's Cup movie ever. 
It really does get into the drop. Who said that? Oh, Dick Anderson produced a good movie back in 77 called The Best Defense for Ted Turner. You know, we could put Dick Anderson and Ron on, on a stage together. Well, aren't you guys, instead of me gas-bagging this afternoon, put the two of you up here and have a debate about, you know. Huh? Uh, anyway, it was, a great, it was a great film, and it's, uh, that's just the trailer from it. This day to... How do we get out of... There we go. Um, I'll come to that slide. On this day eight years ago, remember, we were behind... I was on the race committee vote as the, this is what ministers of external affairs do. They deal as the representative to the race committee. And the SNG, Society Nautique Genève, their yacht club, Alinghi's Yacht Club, would not start the race committee because they didn't think the conditions were right, even though the, uh, Harold Bennett, who was the race officer, said, we're starting the race. And the, they were staffing the race committee. They went on strike. They refused to pull the flags and sound the horns. So it's no joke. And it happened, and it was, it was really one of the most unsportsman. Okay, you can say about the America's Cup. Somebody says, this is one of the most unsportsmanlike conduct things I ever saw <laughs> in the long history of the Cup. In any event, uh, John Kostecki of this club made perhaps the most brilliant call of that two races. It was only two race series. It's deed of gift, first to win two races out of obviously three. And we're, we get a big separation. They get ahead of us, as you heard Larry say. And now they are a little, we're on port tack going into the top mark, which is a 30, it's a 30, 20 mile windward in return. 20 miles. That's the deed of gift courses. The first one is 13 miles equilateral triangle. The second one is 20 miles in return. And then the third, if necessary, is another 13 mile equal triangle. So both boats are on port tack. Alinghi is ahead and to leeward, a little shy of the ley line. Mark's up here. And they tack, we're, I guess we're both going out, they both tack. Kostecki calls the tack and nails the ley line from about four miles out. Nails it. And we sailed, they came, crossed us, tacked ahead into windward us. Our guys sailed through them to leeward and went on to win the race and the cup. It was one of the most brilliant calls by a member of this club who I guess he grew up in Richmond, didn't he? Where did he grow up? Yeah. I raced against him in Bloody Sunfish back, and he was a Sunfish world champion. He's not a bad sailor. Okay, so after that in 2010, we brought the trophy back. We had celebrations. We went to City Hall. We started negotiating venues. And then, as you all know, fast forward to 2013, we had the miracle on the bay. That's the sporting green from that day a few years um, on. And then it went to Bermuda over my dead body. I quit in disgust because I thought I've only worked for American clubs since New York Yacht Club in 80. The 87 Cup. I actually, I worked for New York in 80 and 83, too, when I was at U.S. Sailing, helping the teams, the defenders, including Tommy Blackwater. And when they took the cup offshore, I disagreed wholeheartedly. I sh it, we could have done a deal here. This was a fabulous event here in 2013. We could have, if we couldn't do a deal with the soups, we could have run it where? Long Beach, San Diego, Newport, Rhode Island. We could have run it in this country. Instead, Larry let Russell take it to Bermuda, where Bermuda gave them 77, the organizing committee, $77 million to run the event. This is a country of 65,000 people that has a debt north of $2 billion, a national debt. Now, we should talk with what's going on in this country, but that's another issue. Okay, so the Kiwis won it in 2017 in Bermuda, and I think the next cup's going to be pretty cool. I am cautiously optimistic, and here are some of the details. This is what you really wanted to hear about, what's up with the 2021 Cup. Where is this? Auckland, New Zealand. In the foreground on the left, just at the foot of the bridge, is the, you were just there, sir, Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, where the Cup is on display. It has an emergency system so that some knucklehead can't come in there with an axe and axe it like happened in, what, 1997 or 8? The, uh, it's, at night, this big, it looks like something in Fort Knox comes down over the cup and locks it, and it's, a, you know, it's bulletproof and everything else. And if somebody uh, blasts past the reception, they can push a button. There's motion detectors, but the cup is on display otherwise. You can go in. It's on display. They let the public in. It's a nice affair. Uh, that area, let me go point it out. Those of you who are 
Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about the tank farm, those of you who are keen uh, real estate developers. How many of you are real estate developers? <laughs> Come on, this is San Francisco. How many of you are lawyers? <laughs> so that's the venue in 2021. Now, they have, a, they have a caveat that if for some reason they can't do a deal with their local government, which includes both their national government in Wellington, but also their local, they, since we were last there in 2003, they've created a super city, uh, Auckland super city, they call it, and it's all what used to be independent town governments and county government, I don't know what all they call it. And it's ginormous and it's hugely in debt. It's, it's, it's almost like if you took the whole Bay Area and put everybody under one governing body, one budget, one tax structure. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? So who are these gentlemen? On the left is Patrizio Bertelli, the head of the Italian team. On the right, Grant Dalton, the head of the Kiwi team. Uh, Patrizio also was upset about the event being in Bermuda and about Russell Coots changing the class of boat twice before they got to the starting line. And he and his Prada team, after sailing in every cup since 2000, they stood down and they didn't race in 13 in Bermuda. Instead, they gave money and technical assistance to the Kiwis. In return, gave them $30 million, reportedly. 30 Kiwi, which is you know, still real money. It's, call it 18, 20 U.S. And lent them his head of his sailing team, Patrizio's head of his sailing team, and so on. And they are now the challenger of record for the next cup. They, together with the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, are making the rules. So the challenger of record is the Circolo, who speaks Italian? <laughs> who speaks Italian? Circolo della Vela Sicilia, I'm told that's pronounced, not Sicilia, like we might, Sicilia, is that right? Come on, there's nobody who speaks it. Sicilia. Mario, you speak German, can you do this for us? <laughs> Italy. That's the Italian team. It's Patrizio Bertelli's Prada team, and no surprise, in Sicily. And they, together with the Kiwis, have created the protocol. The protocol are the ground rules for the next cup. By mutual consent, the defender, Royal New Zealand Yacht Squad, and their flags in the upper, the Burgies in the upper left corner, and the Sicilian Yacht Club, together have made the rules governing the next cup who can challenge, when you challenge, how much it costs to challenge, what the class will be, what the dates will be, yada, yada, yada. So, what are the rules? The first biggest departure is the most strict nationality rule ever. This is a real nationality rule that has, uh, has a requirement that at least 20% of the team, not just be residents, but actually be nationals, have be passport-carrying citizens of the country. 20%. The rest of the team all have to be residents for a long period of time, for 180 some odd days in this upcoming period. So it's, you can't live in Italy and then go to New Zealand and have a, or if you're a Kiwi, but let's say you're an Italian, you can't go to Italy and get a gas bill and a cell phone bill and say, hey, I'm a resident of Italy. That's what we used to do when we had the somewhat weak, weaker residency rule that we put in for the the New York Yacht Club that we put in for the 1980 Cup. It's a real rule, and it's hurting some of the teams. It's, it's maybe an argument against the rule is that some teams like China, Japan maybe, teams that haven't had, don't have a rich history in, in America's Cup uh, are finding it difficult to get sailors. But I don't think so. I think the real problem is the cost in terms of teams. But I still think it's going to be a pretty good event, and I think this nationality rule. How many of you are watching the Olympics? How many of you cheered for that Sean, what's his name? White. White. Yeah. Or the, the Korean gal, who Korean-American gal, Chloe. Chloe, Kim Chloe, Chloe Kim, whatever. I mean, this is fantastic to cheer for those Americans and the, the other kid who's the red something who's a skateboarder. And that's the red? Gerard. Gerard, thank you. Uh, that, to me, is what the Olympics is about and should be about. That, to me, is what the America's Cup should be about. This team had an all-American team in 2000. And did you have an All-American team in 87? Absolutely. Okay. Dennis had All-American teams when he won. And I think you'll see virtually all Kiwi, all Italian, all-American team with one or two exceptions for New York's challenge, and we'll tell you about that. I think it's a good rule. How many of you think it's a good rule? Yes. How many of you think it's a bad rule? 
What's the online response, Julia? Are you getting any any snarky comments about Mike? It does. Thank you. And and it doesn't say it explicitly. And remember, New York Yacht Club in that very first race around the Isle of Wight in 1851 had an English navigator, had an English captain. Charlie Barr, who won the cup three times for New York at the turn of the last century, was not a naturalized American citizen until, I think, his third defense. So you remember the, ex the expression Swedish steam? There were a lot of Swedes, Norweg Norwegian steam, Swedish steam too. Some of us are Norwegian, some of us are Swedes. Are you, are you Norwegian? Norwegian? I am. Half Norwegian. But in any event, you had... Anderson is. I thought you were Danish. <laughs> In any event, the, the Washington, Russia. Russia. Oh, how interested! Ask them if they if they manipulated the last election. <laughs> hey, uh, did, let me ask you if you're watching from Russia. We want to know if you helped Trump or if you helped Hillary. Did you help the Donald or did you help Hillary? Seriously, this we laugh, but this is a feature that Ron and I want to get to is that you can watch this anywhere in the world and Julia or someone will sit here and monitor questions like I do with my Tuesday show because we get questions from all over the world and Julia monitors them and we answer them. And it's a nice feature for a club of this stature to have good speakers and then have people be able to watch it and ask questions. So we, we aim to do that, right, Ron? That's right. Okay. So the nationality rule is a big deal. The other big deal is this boat. Now, Patrizio Bertelli, when they did their deal, Patrizio the Challenger of Record, he wanted to have a monohull. So this is the monohull they came up with, which to most people looks more like a trimaran. It's a foiling monohull. You've seen the pictures, right? Have you seen the video? It's an AC-75. It's 75 feet long, not, I think not counting the bowsprit. And here's what the boat will look like. Video four.
So that's what the 36th America's Cup is going to look like, at least in terms of the nationality rule and the yacht. Here are some of the specifics. It will take place, the actual final racing will take place January through March. The Prada Cup, you heard that right, the Prada Cup, formerly the Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton Cup for the Challenger Selection Series will take place in January, February of 2021. The match will take place in March. The America's Cup match between the ultimate challenger and the defender. The defender, of course, will be Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. The challenger will be one of three or four teams, probably. The 75-foot high-performance monohull. You heard about the nationality rule, 20% citizens. All must be residents very soon and stay resident, not running around the world sailing in other regattas. 100% of the hull must be laminated in the country of the club it represents. We have relaxed that so-called CIC, constructed in country rule. It's been relaxed and relaxed and relaxed to where last time you only had the forward few meters of the boat had to be built. So those boats in Bermuda were built all over the place, largely in New Zealand, and the, the Japanese team or the French team had to build a few meters of the front edge of the pontoons in their home country. It was a joke. And as you said, sir, about the deed of gift, that's really, in my opinion, an aberration. The deed of gift has always intended it to be a test of national technology, built, boat building technology as well as sailing tape. So this is, I think, a good rule as well. The secrecy rules, which we've more or less gotten rid of over the last 20 years, no skirting will be permitted again. So you'll be able to see under the boats all the time. You, a team, this is a cost-cutting rule, can only build two of these behemoths, a maximum of two. Some will build only one, perhaps. There is no, for the first time ever, no tank testing or wind tunnel testing permitted. Again, to try to cut down on costs. The race course will be back to the traditional windward lured, like we used to see an upwind start of uh, 40 to maybe 50 minutes. In the match, the finals, is the first to win seven races. Seven out of, what is that, Lenny? How many, come on, you can do the math. Uh, but how, yeah, but how, what's the max could it could be? 13. 13. Week, who, are you a math, who said that? Are you a mathematician? Oh, you're not a mathematician. You're an artist, for God's <laughs> sakes. Or an art dealer. Okay, seven, best of 13. 2019, that is the boats. You can't splash your first AC-75 until a year from now. They're not going to get the class rule until the end of March this year. They can splash their first boat at the end of March next year. And then in 2019 and in 2020, there will be some regattas around the world in these boats. There will be one in Italy at Patrizio Bertelli's, in, in presumably in, uh, in Sicily. There will be one in Newport, Rhode Island. There may be one in Miami. There's some talk about doing it in Miami for reasons that are beyond me, but there, there will... Be one in Newport, Rhode Island for sure because New York Yacht Club has already filed a challenge. No one knows that. It's not been made public, but you heard it first here. <laughs> then there will be a Christmas regatta in December of 2020. So if you're looking for something to do, Pam, you're planning your holidays. Take your dad. He'll you know, go down there in December. And they're not sure if it's going to be fleet or match racing, but in 2020. And then the Prada Cup in early 21, and then the AC match in March of 21 for the 36th edition of the oldest trophy in sport. I don't know what this thing looks like. Mo a lot of people wonder whether it's really going to sail, but these are smart people. The America's Cup, if it were raced in Maxi 72s or TP 52s or Pac 52, it would just be another weekend regatta. I mean, we have those kinds of boats in the big boat series. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But the America's Cup, in my opinion, does need to be something special. Now, this is pretty special. <laughs> these boats are weird. And these arms, which have foils, these are the foil arms and the foils, are ballasted. There's a ton and a half of ballast in these foils. So the boat, will, they say, will have positive riding moment because they will capsize. When you're at the dock, they both, these foil arms go all the way down, as you saw in the video. So it's got to be, you know, they're going to draw 15, 16 feet. But some very smart people have been working on this now for quite a time, including the head of Emirates Team New Zealand's technical team. I've had him on my show, on my Tuesday show, live, and he was a very 
solid interview, wouldn't you say, Julia? Really good, smart guy, had the right answers. He said, look, this is, this is brave new world stuff. But the America's Cup has always been about brave new world stuff. Like that Trimaran and Catamaran movie we just saw from 2010. Now, remember when Russell Coote said, you know, this is pretty amazing stuff. We'll probably not see anything like this in our lifetime. <laughs> well, look at what we've seen since. Foiling catamarans out here going 45 knots. Foiling 50-footers in Bermuda going maso menos the same speed. And these things are going to go the same speed as well, maybe faster. They're going to foil in 12 knots of boat speed, they say. 12 knots of boat speed. And they'll probably have 12 knots of boat speed and 8 knots of breeze. So, Dan, uh, uh, let me come to the Q&A. We'll get Ron up here, and we'll, we'll come back to that. So just to wrap this up, there's going to be a lot of one design features on the boats to cut costs. It's not going to be a wing sail. It's going to be a D-section mass with a soft double sided mainsail around it, apparently. That's the plan. Roller furl headsails, a jib, and, a, and an A-sail. High torque electric power for the foil. There may be a battery. You know, this may be Tesla-type stuff. We don't know for sure. They probably do know, but they haven't told me. The boats will both displace and foil. When they get up to speed, they will foil. They will use grinders, not cyclors. The cyclers you saw, the peddlers that you saw in the Kiwi, that's not going to be. And as I mentioned, the first boat can be launched not before March 31st of next year. Nonetheless, it's expensive. New York's budget is north of $120 million, of which they've raised half of it. So they're, they're going to be expensive campaigns. Speaking of New York, they have filed a challenge. They were the first one to file right after the challenge period opened on January 1st. And their leadership is Terry Hutchinson on the left. They were speaking. You saw them, uh, Bill, you saw them at the leadership forum. It was a good, good discussion, wasn't it? I've seen the video. Terry Hutchinson, who's a famously good, maybe the best sailor in the country today. Uh, Phil Lotz, Commodore Lotz in the middle. Who, I, those of you who know him, he's a, he's a class act. And key part of this, this is New York Yacht Club not going to let some syndicate run the thing and run, and run it amok. They're going to be sure that New York Yacht Club, as I'm sure St. Francis would, would have proper... Uh, proper ethics, proper rule compliance, and I think you'll see New York's team the same. And Hap Fouth on the right, or the second, third, third from the left, second from the right, Hap Fouth is a very successful businessman from Minnesota, originally living in Palm Beach, I guess now, who is also a very successful ocean racer. They are the key three, and they've also announced that that's Hap on the right, Hap Fouth, who is the CEO. Original Terry was going to be the CEO. They've decided that maybe Terry should be the executive director and the sailing director and not the CEO. Hap, um, Mr. Fouth, has a Maxi 72 called Bellamente, you may have heard, very successful. They were the world champs in 2016. And he's building a new Maxi 72 as we speak. The other key member of their team is Doug DeVos, who's the president of Amway Corp. I work for his daddy, for Uncle Rich DeVos, who is the chairman of our 87 America's Cup team. Doug DeVos also owns Quantum Sales, so Quantum Racing, and he's had Terry sailing with him on their TP-52. And guess who else is a member of their syndicate? The answers are on the slides. Roger Penske. Well done, Commodore. You're sitting close to the screen so you can see the answers. Eh? <laughs> Roger Penske has joined the team and is helping to fund it and also helping to strategize it. He's part of the executive committee. Yeah, not the guy on the left. Rick, guy on the right. What did the Russians say, Julia? We're too busy helping ourselves. No time for Hillary. <laughs> We're too busy helping ourselves. No time to help Hillary or the Donald. I wonder who that is. Oh, well, we don't need to hear that. I'm sure the, the DOJ will be on to them immediately if they're watching this show. So in New York, the name of their team is a bit of a mouthful, Bella Mente Quantum Racing BMQR Association. Ron, have you named your team that? No. Huh? Short answer. What was this? Golden Gate Challenge had a little bit more of a ring to it. But they're the first in challenger. Whose uh, burgee is this? Royal well done, the Royal Yacht Squadron. They will challenge. That's Ben Ainsley, Land Rover BAR. And they will be in again as they were in Bermuda. They were racing this past weekend in San Diego. That's Ben Ainsley on the left. 
They were sailing in the Pac-52 on Gladiator that's owned by Tony Langley, second from the right. And Bill Dana, there's your friend. I put this slide in for you, the Commodore of San Diego Yacht Club. Uh, Mike Dorgan, right? Mike Dorgan, a hell of a nice guy, peach of guy. I hope you invite him. Is Tommy still here? I hope we invite him to the Stag Cruise. I'm sure we will. But this guy, Tony Langley, is the real deal. He's a great sailor. He's been sailing TP-52s, and he and Ben Ainsley and a couple others, the Brits will be funded, land thanks to Land Rover and others, and they're, they will be in, and they've hired away from what was Oracle Team USA's general manager. Who was Oracle Team USA's general manager? You know who that is? Grant Simmer. Well done. The Australian who won the cup in 83 as the, what was he? Navigator, I think, on Australia too back in Newport in 83. Good guy, smart guy, and they will be strong. You've got two strong challengers there in New York and the Royal Yacht Squadron, and the name of their team is Land Rover BAR, and what does BAR stand for? Ben Ainsley Racing. Well, a smart group here. This morning, I, I like to bring tomorrow's headlines today. This is in tomorrow's paper, 15 February, in the New Zealand Herald this morning, where it is tomorrow. Team New Zealand is battling the government, it says, and Auckland Council, the local group, over the America's Cup bases. What's new? What a surprise. As if this, I, I've paid no attention to this, and I don't want you to pay any attention to it, because I guarantee them to you the next event will be in Auckland. It's not going to be someplace else in New Zealand. It's not going to go to Europe. They're going to have the cup there. They'll sort this out. But sometimes you wonder about local politics. We should talk here, I guess. So what they're arguing about, as I pointed out earlier, I brought this slide back, that tank farm. Ronnie, point to it right in the middle for me, would you please? That tank farm. You want to get that shot, Ryan? <laughs> that tank farm. You know what it's like to pull down oil tanks that are 40 or 50 or 60 years old, the remediation that's involved and yada, yada. Well, they're trying to clear that out because it's an eyesore. The rest of the inside there and to the right... We you, just Photoshop the set. We, well... <laughs> They'd like to do that. But that's where they would like to build bases in a year's time. And they're as environmentally sensitive in New Zealand as we are here. So it's a, it's a challenge. This is what they hope to do. That's the, on the left is the, uh, the ta what is now the tank farm. And they've got room for super yachts. They've got room for lots of things. And room for, you know, six or maybe seven bases. And it's an, it looks like a nice setup right outside the viaduct where some of you will remember we were in 2000 and 2003. And they, they'll, it'll, get, it'll all sort out. So the defender is the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. Their team, of course, is Emirates Team New Zealand. And I'm also very pleased to report that it was in the New Zealand papers this morning, Thursday morning, that they have re-signed Glenn Ashby, the Australian. Kiwis have an Australian skipper. Can you imagine that? That would be like this club saying, going down to Norbert, say, hey, Norbert, we want you as the next Commodore. We're having a little <laughs> dispute down here about our Commodores. <laughs> or like somebody from Ann Arbor going down to Columbus and finding somebody from Ohio State to come help us run University of Michigan. <laughs> Glenn Ashby is one of the finest sailors of any stripe, multi-hull, whatever. He's won a, a heap load of multi-hull and foiling-type championships and he has been re-signed. He will be their skipper again, as he was in Bermuda, and they're going to be tough to beat. That is the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. With that, may I invite Ron up here, and we will move to our Q&A position. Thank you. I didn't be, mean to be impolite, Ron. Maybe we can take the question from the gentleman. Yeah, hold on. The Norwegian. So we should say, for those just joining us, welcome to the Windsor Yachting Luncheon live from the St. Francis Yacht Club with our beautiful view. And we'll have a Q&A session now. And if you have a question, raise your hand, and John will come around and stick a mic in front of you. Nice short questions. We've got one right over we here, We got Ron. right off the bat. Dick, you have a question. Um, given the arm that will be up on the windward side, which will give new meaning to a windward boat must keep clear. <laughs> um, are there any changes to the racing rules contemplated as a result of that? 
Yes, they are talking about establishing a diamond around the yacht, and if one of the other yachts sails with into that diamond, there would be an infringement that would be penalized. So let me ask you a question, Tom. When, in fact, uh, in the America's Cup thus far, there's always been an advantage for the challengers. Can you talk about the advantage, the advantage of being a challenger versus a defender in the America's Cup? The defender, initially at least, always has a home court advantage. As we said, the defender has always won the first time. They've always successfully defended the first time, every time since New York lost it in 83, except once. You remember which club did not defend the first time? Australia did not. Australia in 87. Because there were, thir to your point, there were 13 challengers, six of which were American, and we went down to Australia, and the competition on the challenger side was awesome. We made each other better. We started out as the New York team. We were far and away the best team at first. We didn't get any better. Three new boats. And we built three boats, and they got successfully slower. <laughs> No joke. We should have used our first boat, but we couldn't because we had benefactors and contributors. You know, we go, oh, geez, you're going to use your first boat? Well, why do I give money to build the other two? So this time you've got three really good teams challenging. Three you, legit. Three legit. You've got, you got Prada, Patrizio Bertelli, the Italians. You've got Ben Ainsley and the Brits, and you've got New York with Terry Hutchinson Hapfile, Doug DeVos, Quantum, Bellamente Quantum Racing, BMQR, Bellamente Quantum Racing. They all will be tough. The budgets are big. Let's think about the budgets. What was the budget in 2000, in 1983, when Dennis won the budget was $4 million. In 83, exactly. It was $4 million. In 87, the budgets were... $10 million. Were, ours was Ten. 16 Yeah, we, were, we spent eight point seven. And Dennis's, Dennis's was Maso Menos 16. Fast forward to more recently, and they're north of 100. Yeah. And this will be north of 100, so it's big money. Orko spent 400 no. to get to win, no. ultimately counting all of his challenges put together. Oh, no, he spent it, more it, than that. It, yeah, four, best number we have is 400 to win in three challenges. You can think about that. So that's a big number for a guy to basically go out and commit over the next decade. Well, Larry's win. a big guy. Yeah. A member of this club. And there are a lot of guys like Larry. And, and this has always been a big guy and get girl, big guys and gals event. Right. This, this is not for the faint of heart. You, you know, we'd all like to see one design AC7, uh, Maxi 72s, and then you'd have 30 clubs challenging. I'd like to see owner drivers. I'd like to see, you know, mm -hmm. people like... Turner types. Turner, Ted Turner sailing, who have got a real jobs, but that ain't going to happen. Mike Vanderbilt. Mike Vanderbilt, Commodore Vanderbilt, who won three times in 30, 34, and 37. You got a so we got a question here. Bill. Yeah, the, um, you mentioned something about the mainsail design. Could you d describe more what you, were, what you were referred to as a two-sided mainsail it, and why... They're, they seem to have abandoned the uh, winged sail that uh, had so much development into it, whether it just doesn't work on monohulls or what's the story behind that? That's part of it, is that you need a wide platform to support the wing. Part of it is that the wing, the, the logistics involved with the wing, you have to come in, you have to lift the whole boat out with the wing then every night, and you have to lift the wing out every night, otherwise the thing's going to sail away. You can rarely leave the boat in the water with the wing up. You know, back in 88, Dennis had his catamaran with a wing sail when we won the cup in 88. And at night, he had the, I can't remember what we called it, but he strapped it into a hydraulic frame and turned it over on its side. But the wing then tried to still lift, tried to be an airplane wing instead of a sail. So there's a lot of logistical problems with the wing. There's a lot of expense involved, especially in the control systems. This will be a more standard D-sail, D-section mass, as I'm led to believe, with a wraparound sail, mainsail on either side, which is kind of high-tech stuff. They're, these exist. And the thought is this will have trickle-down into the sport, more so than the, the hard wings. Do you know if there's been a model uh, built, or is it just all computer that they're going to build a 75-foot boat on? It's so far they've sailed it extensively in the computer. And as I say, this Dan Bernasconi, the, the technical director for Team New Zealand, and the guys working for Patrizio Bertelli, these are smart guys. And the VPLP guys in France who are helping, 
these are smart guys and they built more radical stuff than this. I can tell you, I can, I'll tell you here, or, or, no one's going to put this on the internet, are they? <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to keep this secret. <laughs> I, I can tell you that the Kiwis are putting such a mainsail system on a trimaran as we speak. Or so I'm reliably informed as of this morning. This is, it's fun to be a journalist because this stuff just comes in now, and you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Talk about publishing the next rule. Coming class up class rule is, is say, they say they're going to have it published by the end of March. I've been involved in writing every class rule since the 12-meter days except for the last one, and I'll tell you, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. I, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a C lawyer, and those of you who are wordsmiths or lawyers you know how difficult it is. You put one comma in the wrong place, one clause ahead of the other clause, and it means something entirely different. And to get a class rule right is really hard. And there will be loopholes, just like there were the loophole that, that allowed foiling out here. We didn't intend to allow foiling in 2013, but the Kiwis found the loophole. Uh, Tom, other than the three challenges you've mentioned, do you think there will be any more? I, I'm not sure. There is still an Australian effort. Uh, Tommy Slingsby and so are trying to get an Australian effort together. There is rumor of one or two others. There was a West Coast effort, as you know, Bruce. But when the boat came out and the cost of the boat, I think that, that uh, discouraged some people. I think, however, to have three really good – and remember last time we had, what, five challengers? What do we have, six teams in Bermuda? Five challengers. Five. And of those five, arguably only two were really – I think you got three really good challengers. I think it's going to be a, a pitched battle in the Prada Cup. And I think this could be the most interesting cup perhaps since 87, just with those four teams. But I think will there be more than four teams? I think it's going to be tough. We'll see. Maybe one more. In Valencia in 2010, uh, the giant triman versus the big catamaran, I was on the finish line, and there were really no more than – 16, 1,700 people who could see the finish. Talk a little bit about America's Cup spectating in New Zealand. Well, they, the Kiwis, this is their, one of their, what, two or three national sports along with rugby and arguably cricket. And they will do a fabulous job as they did in 2000 and 03. How many of you were in New Zealand for either the 2000 Cup or the 03 Cup? I mean, they were, they were just fabulous events. They build, they go to all this expense and time and energy to build a nice basin of viaduct to harbor. And the racing will be outside. I didn't say so on the show, but the racing will be outside off Takapuna Beach. So you're going to go out around the North Heads. You're going to go out past Rangitoto, the, the hopefully still dormant volcano on the right. <laughs> Although that's a pretty seismically <laughs> active country, as you know. But think we about should the, talk here. But think about the exposure, Tom, because remember, I if know. it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> yeah, I try to remember that. <laughs> But God forbid the volcano goes off in the middle of America. <laughs> You're a lot that of fun. Hurt, that wouldn't hurt viewership, would it, Tommy? <laughs> I'd rather have the stuff that Stan Honey, a member of this club, has been doing to lift the game. But you, you'll be this time they'll sail it right off the beach, off Takapuna Beach, and the wind either blows off the beach or onto the beach, and they're not going to have four different race courses like they did, or so they tell me. I think it's going to be great viewing. They, it's much more conscientious that the race organizers are for viewing. But the television is hugely better thanks, as I said, to Stan Honey. Remember, Stan Honey not only did the virtual graphics and all this stuff, but he put yard lines on the race course. And that, to me, has been the single biggest innovation for race viewing. I don't like the boundaries, frankly. That was mm -hmm. Russell's idea. And I, but the yard lines... So you can see who's ahead and, uh, and see the wind shift. I think that was some pretty brilliant stuff by, as I say, a member of this club. Julia, how are the Russians doing? Okay. If you have a question, raise your hand. And John, stand up and uh, bring mics over to them. The mic over. Where's John? Hey, John, John you got a guy over here who wants here. a question. While we're waiting. So, Tom, talk about the speeds you're hearing people talk about with the new foiling monohulls. And what is it, and also about the wind window, what kind of breeze? I, I think the Kiwis want this to be run in a wide breeze range. They're talking about, um, you know, sails, different size mains or, or uh, reefable mains because they want to be able to sail in the up range. What's the window? Guest window? Guest I, window? I think it'll be 6 to 26. I think a real 6 to 26. Mm -hmm. yes, From sir. what I'm hearing. I mean, this is all brave new world stuff, so.
Yes, Mark. All right, so I don't quite understand the rule for not doing testing, like wind testing, tunnel testing. Generally, you said it was for cost. Generally, the, for engineering, that reduces cost uh, to focus on, on how to you know, um, <clears throat> design something without actually building it. And, does, and how does computer simulation, which is just a modern version of wind, wind testing, uh, factor into those restrictions? The assumption is that you use tunnel, wind, wind tunnel and towing tanks these days to validate the tools, the computational fluid dynamics, the CFD tools in the computer. So if you, and the, uh, frankly, the computer tools prediction models have gotten so good that if you just say, well, don't go off and try all that stuff, just do it all on the computer, will save money, and I think it will. There's also a surrogacy rule. Can you say that? Is that politically correct to say a surrogacy <laughs> rule? <laughs> Commodore, is that okay? Kimball, can I say that? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> the point is you can't build a boat that looks like, walks like, quacks like one of these things, or are you breaking the rules. So you can't go out and build a, a surrogate. Save money. I think it'll save money. I think tank testing is frankly pretty outmoded these days. The, comp the computers, the, com the CFD tools are so good that you don't, you don't, sound, you don't, you don't sound convinced. Let's don't debate it. Let's talk about it afterwards. I'll buy you a glass of wine or something, or you can buy me one. <laughs> so, uh, Tom, as those who were around 83 remember, it's actually a bottomless cup, no bottom on the cup. And um, are you going to think, give, give us some ballpark, help the audience understand the size of the amount of money spent uh, for chasing the cup in the last 150 years? I, I couldn't even guess. I mean, Bob, Fisher, but it, but Bob Fisher's made a guess, but, you know, it's billions. I mean, Most estimates are that it's three-plus billion dollars. Oh, it's probably more than that. In today's dollars? Mm -hmm. I mean, just think, what, just think what Commodore Vanderbilt spent in 30, 34, 37 in today's dollars, or Lipton spent mm -hmm. in his five. I, I couldn't hazard a guess. Fisher, Bob Fisher's made a guess. The cup started out, as you saw on one of the slides, it's only about this tall, and it was bottomless. It was a trophy made by Gerards of London, 1848. It was just sitting on the shelf at the Royal Yacht Squadron. And they were trying to get bets, and no one could do it, so they pulled the, sh the trophy off and said, here it is, the 100-pound cup, because the cup cost 100 pounds, pounds, and in those days you named the trophy after the cost. The Americans came back, thought that it was 100 guineas and that a guinea was, and a pound was like a dollar and a buck. It's not, as any of you who are Anglophiles know, a guinea is a dollar six, or a pound, one pound six pence, maso menos. So that's it wrongly engraved. It's actually engraved as the 100 guinea cup. The cup grows. Two bases have been added for more engraving space because the results of every match, every race in every match, including the time and the course length, and so on, is all engraved on the cup. It's now got two additional sections and a third a section about to be added. And it, it is bottomless. When New York had it bolted, to, no joke, had it bolted to a table in that little ante room off the, off the uh, bar at 44th Street, and when they realized they were losing it, and Bob, I think Bob Taus, whoever the House Committee Chairman was, the equivalent of Bill Dana, was tasked to go to New York and get it, unbolt it from the table and bring it up to Newport so it could be awarded to the, to the Aussies. And they, unbolt, they unbolted it and then they poured champagne into it, full of champagne to have one last hurrah, you know, one last hurrah, and they lifted the thing up off the table and the ultimate, they had champagne all over. all over the floor, all over themselves, their nice, you know, their nice Madison Avenue shoes. Brooks Brothers shoes. <laughs> I can say that. I've been a member of New York since 81, so I can say that. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir, over here. Kimball, you're talking Kimball. next week. I talk any time you want to, Tom. <laughs> but I, I got to touch the microphone. <laughs> You've been quizzing us. I have one for you. Yes, sir. What is the second oldest perpetual challenge trophy in North America? I don't know. Is it the San Francisco Cup? The San Francisco Perpetual Challenge Trophy, 1895. Well done. Okay. <laughs> Canada's Cup's right up there. Stanley Cup is up there. Lord Stanley's Cup. Or are you Another talking about question? yachting, sailing? 
Yes, Dick. Uh, you mentioned in the slide batteries, and I'm curious about the stored energy rule and the reason why you're not having cyclers and grinders to the extent before because you weren't allowed to store energy. So are they talking about being able to store energy now? They're still working on that, as I understand it. They're closing in on the rule. There's, there's a lot of controversy, as the Kiwis or the Brits might say, on how to do that. You, you, it, on a swing keel boat, you've got to have enough energy, whether it's by an engine or by battery electric, something, so that you can swing the keel on these things to tack these boats and get a 1.5 ton arm up and down on each side. They're going to have to have stored energy to do that because you're, you just there's only going to be 11 guys, it looks like, on the boat, 11 people, crew, men and women, perhaps. So they're going to have to have some stored energy to do that. And then the sail trimming, as I understand it, is all going to be manual power like the good old days. Good. And cyclers are apparently banned, will be banned. Next question. In the last cup, they had cyclists and non-sailors, a lot of them, on the boats. Yes. Is there a requirement that people know how to sail to be in the America's Cup? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you will see this time, <laughs> unlike a couple of those teams that had the forward three, where they, they knew how to sail. I mean, don't get me wrong. By the time they were done, they were probably better sailors than all of us in this room. But this time you're going to see people on the handles and also, you know, doing other work in the boat. So I think you're going to see real sailors on real boats. I think the boats, you know, assuming they work, and there's every indication from the smart people I know, and I'm talking to a lot of people, not just Grant Simmer, but Ian Burns and others, who are cautiously optimistic that this boat is going to be pretty darn cool. Yes, sir, question here. Is there any discussion in the, as they develop the rules of requiring a minimum number of women in, on the crew? Uh, I'm not aware that there has been that discussion. Uh, I'm certainly a proponent of that. The Volvo has, has put in a rule uh, that doesn't require women on the boat, but if you add a woman or two, you can add them, you get more hands. You can have, you have to have a minimum of, what is it, seven crew, and then you can add two more if they're women you can add them and there's no crew penalty. So I think, and that's gotten women involved in the Volvo and I think helps in the sport. I would like to see the America's Cup do something like that because at the end of the day, it's a strength to weight ratio issue and you don't see many women on the, on the you know, offensive line of the 49ers. Of course, the offensive line of the 49ers is probably a bad example, but <laughs> now that we got that good quarterback, maybe that's better. Next question. Hi, um, Tom's heard this, uh, argument a number of times, the trade-off between boat speed, wow, look at those boats go almost as fast as a skateboarder, uh, versus tactics, crew work, and that sort of thing, has been a concern of mine for a long, long time. Um, I enjoyed the days when it was a uh, two-dimensional chess game and all those other th sorts of things, and I guess maybe you'd like to make a comment about that. I was a big fan of big, heavy, slow boats, 12 meters, even the IACC boats after that, as Dick knows. Dick won the cup in 1864, I think it was, on Constellation. <laughs> oh, 1964. Almost the same thing. Same, same thing. <laughs> and um, I, I like that style of racing. I like what we see out here in the big boat series with the big boats. I like the 12-meter the stuff in big air. But at the end of the day, Richard, what we need, as Julia is fond of saying, and I'm fond of saying, you need an iconically beautiful and reliably windy venue. You can have any boat, fast, slow, or otherwise, and if you're in an ugly venue with no wind, it's a disaster. And a different issue. But if you put these boats... I think, as we saw with the catamarans, the foiling, I mean, there was pretty good, pretty amazing racing out here in the 72s. They, they changed positions. They passed each other. They got in the Alcatraz cone. They came in here and got title relief, and there was match racing. Was it better in big, heavy, slow boats? Maybe. But that time's passed us, at least for the moment, and I think these boats might be cool. We shall see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reserve judgment until we see them. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. And the question from Minnesota is? Let, w Julia, wait for the mic. Wait for him. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Julia, help uh, Mark, uh, 
Wharton Reed from Minnesota says, miss the rubbing is racing element possibilities because of the extended foils. Was hoping to get something closer to the VORs. Yeah, I think that's one of the concerns about having these big, whatever you call them, the big foils, is that you know it could be seriously dangerous. You could wipe out the crew on one side of the boat if you, if rubbing is racing, and that's part of what Dick's concern is. You know, we got match racing, we got um, we we put umpiring into the sport 30 years ago. Right now, I, I led the team that did the first umpiring at Congressional Cup. And that helped also get the racing close and the boat-to-boat -boat contact and maneuvering close. I think these guys and gals on these boats and teams, and there are plenty of gals on the teams, maybe not on the boats, I think you'll see them learn to match race and have maybe not rubbing as racing, but I think you're going to see some up-close and personal racing in these boats. I hope so. And if not, I'll be the first one, Dick, to, to be critical. We've been speaking today with Tom Eamon, founder of Sailing Illustrated. Great job, Tom, on what's up with the Cup in 2021 down in New Zealand. Thank you for attending the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. The luncheon is adjourned. Good night, mate. Good night, mate. Thanks, everybody. Great talk, Tom.